everyone to this webinar on the Cardio 2D software. Uh, my name is Carla Bellack and I'm the marketing manager here at Multichannel Systems. Before we get started, I wanted to point out two things. First of all, we are recording this webinar and we will send you the link to the recording during the next days. On the right hand side, you see a Q&A window. Please make use um, of this window. Only myself can see your question and I will read out your question to today's speaker after his presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Thomas Meyer. He is the application specialist for cardiac applications here at Multichannel Systems. He joined our company more than 10 years ago and today he will give you a presentation of about 30 minutes and afterwards, as said before, he is available for the Q&A session. I will now hand over to Thomas to get started. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Carla. Uh, just to repeat one thing, please let us know if any technical issues come up. If you can't hear us, if you can't see the screen sharing, please type something into the Q&A window so that we can look if there are any kind of technical issues. I have made a very general title today and just called it Cardio 2D Software for Mapping and Cardiac, Mapping Cardiac Excitation Patterns. And I hope that you're familiar already a little bit with our hardware, with our standard software. If there is anything missing, please feel free to contact us later on for, for any questions that are not covered in, in this webinar today. Uh, when I say we are looking at cardiac mapping, I would like to begin with a brief introduction why cardiac mapping is, is very relevant for uh, a lot of research fields. The general signal generation in the heart is here in the sinoatrial node. And in that sinoatrial node, we have the spontaneous diastolic depolarization. So from here, you have the autonomous generation of the rhythm. And you have then a network of signal propagation pathways throughout the heart. And of course, you have in the myocardium, you have the signal propagation via the connexins that are connecting, electrically connecting the cells. And you can imagine if you're disturbing the signal propagation pathways, if you have a disturbance or a block of the connexins, that you can generate areas where you have a slowed or even completely broken conduction. And areas with a broken conduction can be the reason for arrhythmia. It can happen that you have spiral waves, that you have re-entry cycles, and these phenomena are usually the first steps in the generation of an arrhythmia. And we are trying to detect these effects as early as possible with mapping on a cellular level, on a tissue level. And I would like to give you a brief summary of the different preparations that work with the Cardio 2D software. We have the option to record on a Langendorf heart. We have flexible microelectrode arrays with 36 electrodes, up to 128 electrodes that can go onto an isolated perforated heart and you do a local mapping on areas either of a few millimeters by a few millimeters or for the larger animals, even of a centimeter dimension areas. And of course, what works in the Langendorf heart works as well in a in vivo system. We have customers working with Cardio 2D in combination with flexible MEAs in rodents, in the open chest preparations, or even in larger animals such as goat, sheep, or pig. And in the larger animals, then usually the arrays with about two centimeter by two centimeter recording area are used. The next lower level of complexity are tissue samples like cardiac slices. Uh, I think all of you have heard about brain slice preparation. That is something that is around since decades. Cardiac slices have been published already a long time ago, but they have not been used a lot for quite a while and have been kind of rediscovered a few years ago. And these cardiac slices can be recorded with our microelectrode array technology, and the analysis is performed then with Cardio 2D. The easiest system is a monolayer of cardiomyocytes cultured on a microelectrode array uh, that can be primary cell cultures like neonatal red ventricular cardiomyocytes, chicken cardiomyocytes, 
or it can be stem cell derived cardiomyocytes such as embryonic stem cell or IPS derived cardiomyocytes. And of course, based on these isolated cells, you could go back a step and go into artificial tissue engineering based on scaffolds on certain matrices. Uh, I've just been in a lab where they use a 3D printer to create a matrix and then put fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes on and put that either on an MEA or use a flexible MEA to record from this matrix of beating cardiomyocytes. Before I come to the Cardio2D software, I would like to show you a screenshot that was done with our classical MCREC software. What you see here is a recording from chicken embryo cardiomyocytes. They are very easy to prepare, very cheap culture, couple over long distances, and we used them for a long time, uh, also for pharmacology testing. You see here on the right hand side an area where you have a lot of small windows. Every little window represents one of the recording electrodes. And here we are looking at one individual recording electrode. You see here a rapid peak sodium channel driven depolarization, followed by a calcium channel plateau. And then finally you go here into the repolarization component. Down here you see a long-term plot. You see that the beating is not very regular. You have a longer spacing here, a shorter spacing between the beats here. But what we do on all of those beats is we are looking for a timestamp of the rapid component and translate this timestamp into a false color profile. So red means early, blue means late, and you see very nicely here the signal is propagating from here over here in this direction. As I said, that is Cardio 2D, that is MCREC, not yet Cardio 2D. In Cardio 2D, things look like this. So what you see in Cardio 2D is on the left-hand side, you see an overview of your chip. Here we have our 8x8 configuration. You see the electrode numbers indicated here. You see for one electrode, a long-term plot here that is a one-minute recording, and you see it's beating in a very regular fashion. And you see here an individual electrode. If you browse over this area, you can select an electrode and you see the timestamp and the marker here. So here at the minimum, we are detecting the signal. And down here, we calculate the propagation into a conduction velocity in meter per second here. So you see we have here a propagation of 20 to 21 centimeters per second. Most impressive part probably is here the conduction velocity map or the, the signal propagation map. Again, red means early, blue means late. The black lines you see here are the isochronous lines with uh, 200 microsecond spacing. The black dots are indicating electrodes and the black circles mean electrodes where we have a signal detection. Here we have one electrode indicated with a white circle. That means on this electrode, the software was not able to detect a signal. Over here, you see the total time scale translated into the false color plot. So you see from red to blue, we have a total of just a little bit less than nine milliseconds. So I already introduced you briefly to the conduction velocity, and I would like to talk briefly about the different conduction velocities we are observing in different samples. When you're working on a Langendorf heart, you usually see conduction velocities of about 50 centimeters per second. Uh, our classical animal in our lab is a guinea pig. That's why we have quite a lot of data from here. Uh, you find similar values for, for rabbit and mice as well. As I said, the next lower level where you still have the tissue intact, but not the whole organ intact anymore is a cardiac slice preparation. Here we had even the chance to work with human tissue from patients. Of course, that is not healthy tissue. Uh, and with the human tissue, we observe here about 40 centimeters per second. Uh, very similar values, a little bit higher. We have from porcine tissue. Porcine tissue might just be higher because we get more healthy tissue here. And for the mouse, we are a little bit lower at about 30 centimeters per second. In the primary culture, the conduction is only via the connexines. You do not have left anything of the excitation propagation system. 
So values are a little bit lower here. You see the small error bar here on the chicken. I think we did hundreds of chicken preparations. So we have very small error bars here at about 20 centimeters per second and a little bit higher at the red neonatal and ventricular cardiomyocytes. We started working on embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes about 10 years ago already. And we got the first human ones in our lab. That must have been about 2004. And you see those cells have been conducting very slowly. We observed conduction velocities between 5 and 10 centimeters per second here. So it was quite a surprise for us when we switched from the ES to the induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes a few years ago, that especially the human, no matter if it is uh, CDI, if it is axiogenesis or repro cells, they are all conducting pretty fast at about 40 centimeters per second. And just to show you about a cell line, HL1 cells for some reason are extremely slow. You will see conduction velocities of just about two centimeters per second. So they are about 20 fold slower than what you expect in real cardiac tissue. Now for the first screenshots from Cardio2D software, again from a paper that we published in Cardiac Mapping in 2012. What you get in the real data is such an overlay plot from the different electrodes along the propagation pathway. And you see very nicely that the signal has a certain delay. Here you're looking at about 5 milliseconds of a delay. Total delay here is 8.5 milliseconds from the earliest to the latest one. So now you determine your timestamps either in the maximum of your signals or in the minimum of your signals or at the point of maximum slope in this signal components. And this is then translated into the false color map without any interpolation. And from here you go, we are a mathematical process into interpolation, either a bicubic or a bilinear interpolation. And you obtain then these maps here with the more smooth looking isochronous lines. But I think it's important to be aware that the real data is just this. Everything that follows in these nice plots is mathematical interpolation. I would like to show you now another reason why it is so important to look at mapping, especially if you're doing pharmacology with your data as well. We have been observing effects that uh, the pacemaker is not always very stable. So what you see here is a video where we update the image with every single heartbeat. And you see very nicely that in the beginning of the video, you have the red colors in the lower left corner and the blue colors in the upper right corner. And after a few heartbeats, it is switching. Uh, you see that the spacing of the isochronous line stays about the same. So the conduction velocity remains conserved, but there is more than one pacemaker triggering this syncytium of cardiomyocytes. And of course, when you have different pacemakers, the signals on the electrodes will look a little bit different. And as you sometimes perform analysis, pharmacological analysis on the, on the averages, as the average over many heartbeats, it is important to identify what populations of heartbeats belong together and kind of averages can be calculated without mixing up a lot of different signals. So I've been talking quite a bit theoretical stuff right now. I would like to switch from here into the software demonstration. And what I would like to do in the next few minutes is first to uh, connect to one of our systems. We have here on the table an MEA 2100 system with a signal generator. And with that one, I would like to show you the data acquisition module of our software. And after that, we go into the analysis module. And for the analysis module, I will first show you a recording on an array with 120 electrodes for a single dose recording where we focus on the mapping. And then in the next step, look at a multi-dose recording that was done on a six-well MEA. And there we look more on the dose response data. So let's switch over to the screen sharing. Again, if there is any issues, if you can't see properly, please let us know via the Q&A window. 
So you see we have two icons here. That is the one for the data acquisition. That is the one we later use for the analysis. And with a double click, I can just start the connection to the data acquisition window. And the first thing is I have to select the device to connect to. And I see here in NEA 2100, serial number one. I can select my sampling rate anywhere from 10 kilohertz up to 40, 50 kilohertz. I see my gain. I see the data format is a 24-bit data format. And I have 64 channels available. And I can select my MEA subtype here and confirm with close. And I'm now starting my data acquisition window over here. You see here on the left-hand side uh, a panel with the different instruments. The first one is a viability tool. If I click this one, I'm connecting to my hardware and I can see if my cells are beating or not beating. And you see here right now, obviously this comes from our simulator, but you see very nicely that I have my simulated activity here from a recording that we originally did on a Langendorf heart here on all channels. What you see as well as you see the label down here, so the detection timestamps of my signal are labeled here. And this is something you would usually perform just as a kind of quality check before you set up your experiment, before you specify the detailed settings. You have a quick look if the cells are good enough or if they might need another day in the incubator. You normally would get here in real time a map for the signal propagation. The problem right now is as I do not have a real cell culture in here, but a signal generator, I send my signal at exactly the same time to all electrodes. That is the reason why we see no propagation here. But I will show you a lot more propagation data later on when we come to the analysis tools. Same reason is usually you would see the latency or the velocity down here in this window. For the moment, latency is the smallest detectable value. So we had a little offset a while ago, but there is not really any offset. That's why nothing is calculated here. So let me stop the viability mode here for a moment. The next icon here is a lab book. So you can enter a lot of details about your experiment here. And then you have the experimental design. We are now in the basic mode. And that is the one I told you. That's the one file recording where you just look at mapping, where you're not into compound testing. If you want to do a compound testing, you can just switch here to compound. And now you have here a layout of a tenfold dilution series or a threefold logarithmic uh, concentration series. And you can set the different wash-in phases, the different recording periods. That is all done in this little dialog here. But let me go back now from here to the basic mode. And uh, then the next tab here is for the stimulation. If you're familiar with our CMOS system already, that is the one with uh, 5,000 electrodes. Uh, this is a little bit smaller here, but the algorithms are the same. So you have three different stimulation patterns that can be assigned to as many electrodes as you wish. And here you have a dialog to design your stimulus patterns exactly and you to control the blanking circuit for the artifact suppression. Down here, analyzer settings. And you see we have three tabs here. The first one is how do you detect your signal? You specify a minimum and a maximum rise time. The reason why we do that is quite simple. There are high frequency disturbances from time to time. And we would like to avoid that you get these high frequency disturbances as wrong detection. So you set something as a minimum rise time, everything that takes longer than 100 microseconds, but is small is faster than about one millisecond. That is then considered as an event, as long as it is about 10 standard deviations larger than the noise level. The reason why I have here the maximum rise time, you want to avoid slow baseline fluctuations to trigger wrong positive detections here. A second option to identify your threshold is just a threshold-based detection. So you can say anything that exceeds minus 50 microvolts threshold or minus 100 microvolts threshold is considered as a signal. And down here is a few more details. At that time, for example, you don't want to trigger another signal within one action potential. 
And also here you define your timestamp. Is it the minimum, the maximum, or the timestamp of the maximum slope? And I will talk a bit more about the average and about the settings here for the 2D detection later on when I come into the analyzer module. Let me just briefly start now the data acquisition. And you see it requires a new file name here. I apply that, apply it to all NEAs, and now the recording is started and data are coming in. So you see it is very, very simple to get your first experiments done with Cardio 2D. So I stop the recording here, and now I'm going to close the data acquisition module. And the next step is Cardio 2D Plus. Cardio 2D Plus is the analysis tool that comes with Cardio 2D. And maybe just one thing about the licensing thing. You would need a license key for Cardio 2D. However, to analyze your data, you would not need a license tool. So if you get some data files and you just want to play around, if you can extract the parameters you want, you can analyze any Cardio 2D data here with Cardio 2D Plus, and you don't need a license key for that one. And that also means you can install it on as many computers as you wish. If you look at the basic pane of the software, you see it looks almost the same as the data acquisition tool, but of course I'm not connecting it to the hardware now, but I'm rather opening a data file here. And the file I'm going to open here was recorded on an NEA with 120 electrodes. Uh, the software we, the hardware we used for that was an NEA 2100 system. And what I'm doing here right now, I'm just adjusting the scaling a little bit. You see we have a very, very huge signals here and I just adjusted the scale bar a little bit. You see, we had here just one recording for a duration of 40 seconds. Again, here is the overview of your NEA used. That is here the different layout of 12 by 12 configuration. Over here, you see the individual signals and I can adjust that by moving the slider over here. So now we are looking at this individual signal here. And I can click on a number of electrodes and superimpose the recordings from the electrodes I'm labeling in green here. I think especially if you look on your screen right now, that looks all the same. So let me stretch the scale here a little bit. And you see that the signals come with a certain time offset. And what you see already here now is we have here a plot voltage versus the position of the electrodes. So here, red means not early, but it means a low voltage value, and blue means a high voltage value. So you see this red and yellow-like colors are about minus 8, minus 10 millivolt, and the blue ones are in the range of plus 5, 6 millivolt. And if I move now this cursor here, you see how the front, how the, how the line of the signal is propagating over the array. And I have a very nice tool here to visualize that. I can switch that into a video tool and simply play now the signal propagation. I turn down the speed so you see nicely how the signal is propagating. And you can imagine if you now do a prior ablation there in the center, if you have some areas here of the, of the tissue where the signal is not conducting, uh, that you could detect very nicely here some re-entry cycles or spiral waves. We are still here in the tab field potential. The next tab is the region of interest selection. Here there is no reason to select or deselect something. I look here at the full 40 seconds of the experiment. If for some reason I don't want any heartbeats, I can just label them and they will not be included into the further analysis. So the next tab is then the so-called heartbeat tab. And here in the heartbeat tab, I look again at one long-term plot. I have here my local activation time map. So this is the map as you have seen it several times before here. Again, red is early, blue is late. And we have here a total delay of about eight and a half milliseconds. And you already see when I move the cursor over the array, when I reach electrodes that have a black label, I can see a nice signal and I get the red label for the detection timestamps. And here we set our analysis to detect the timestamp in the minimum. 
And with this tool, I can just double check if I agree to that detections. And you can see I can click on an electrode. And if I say, for example, well, that's not really the minimum I want. I want it here. I can do that and it will update the map automatically. So now you see that it creates some nonsense there, but it does it automatically. So let me get this back to where it should be. And now you see that the map looks a bit more normal again. Down here you see in the moment a plot showing the latency, so the time delay from the earliest to the latest detection, just over about 8 milliseconds. I can convert that into conduction velocity, and that translates here into about 29 centimeter per second. Maybe you're missing here in this plot still the isochronous lines. That is done in this dialog box. So you have here the contour lines. I can just turn them on. I can set the spacing to, for example, 200 microsecond or maybe 500 microsecond. And then you see very nicely about the spacing. Let's have a look at this one. This looks a bit strange. And you see this is a very tiny signal. So I could cheat a little bit, but you see, probably it is really an issue that this signal is extremely tiny. It might be a far field potential. So the detection of the software is okay. It's just looking a bit strange here. But I can now jump from beat to beat, and you see how the map is updated. You can see how the detection timestamps are conserved or not conserved from heartbeat to heartbeat. And you see the marker over here, you see now we are at about six and a half seconds in the experiment. We are jumping here to the signal at seven, eight, and so on. And you can go through the complete experiment and double check if you're happy with the results. In the next step, we have the aperture and we have the QT analysis. And you see they are empty right now. I just have to run a quick analysis here. For that one, I get my dialog box here. So I stay with this conduction settings here with the detection settings. I activate my aperture and I activate also my QT detection. And as I have a lot of electrodes here, I also leave in the QT, in the two dimensional dialog here, I say minimum 10 electrodes should be in a consecutive area to be able to calculate here a conduction pattern. So let's get this started and see what comes in. And you see right now that we get here the plot of the electrodes that is labeled here. I can overlay a number of electrodes here and you see how the signals differ in shape and size. And you can see very nicely how stable your uh, culture is over time. I would like to stress one point here. I showed you the signals in the beginning and I showed you that we have amplitudes here in the rapid component of up to 10, 12 millivolts sometimes. And at the same time, we are looking here at a repolarization component that is quite tiny. We are below 50 microvolts here. And here it really helps to have a 24-bit data format. Our hardware has an input format of two and a half volt with a sub microvolt resolution. So even though I'm never clipping my signals in the large signals, I still have a very, very good resolution for the smaller components of the signals. If you look at this one, you don't see any kind of digital steps and that is one of the benefits of the 24-bit data format. Let me switch over now to the QT detection. You see it detected very nicely the maximum of the endpoint of my signal of the repolarization component. If I'm not happy with the detection, I can grab this point and move it to, to any point I like. But you see in that moment, when I interfere with my data here, the color turns into red. So the automatic detections are labeled in blue, the manual are in red, and you can track later on in your result file what was done by the software, what was done manual. So you always see where was some manipulation? Where was the software doing well? Where, where did you need to help it a little bit? One reason why we label these things is if you use Cardio2D for drug testing in pharma development, you have to follow sometimes GLP guidelines. You have to follow uh, 
21 CFR Part 11 guidelines and so on. And they all state we have to make sure that there is no manipulation with the raw data. And if we do some manual analysis, it has to be documented. That is the main reason. And that already takes me to the next file that I would like to show you very briefly, and that is a drug testing file. And I'm going to open that one here. That file was recorded with stem cell derived cardiac myocytes from Gloriomics, from a Dutch company in the city of Leiden. And we did that about a year and a half ago on the six well MEAs. And you see here we have a long line of different experimental conditions here. And let me just adjust it to a signal so you actually see something in here. And adjust this a little bit as well. Signals are a bit more tiny, that's why we need the adjustment here. And now you see we have a cluster-like culture of cells here. That's why you have more far-field-like potentials here. And we recorded it from control conditions via picomolar, very low concentrations, up to high micromolar concentration range. If you're looking now here at the region of interest, you see we have by far not as a regular beating as we had before. You see here certain areas where the cells are beating more rapidly. You see here an area of irregular beating. And you see that there is also here such an area that there is a certain modulation of the amplitude of the signals. And for that reason, we excluded here certain areas where you have some irregularities from the analysis. Here at the heartbeat tab, you see the excluded areas now over here. And the real interesting things you see here in the aperture. In the aperture, you now have an overlay plot for the different recorded conditions and, of course, also for the different electrodes here. But what you see here is the increasing concentrations of the drug. And you see in the beginning, we have pretty stable conditions. And then when we come here, what is this greenish one that is recording number eight? So we come here to the low micromolar concentration, one micromolar and then going up on to, to 10 micromolar, you see here a very significant prolongation of your signal. And let's hope that we get this detection over here as well. So we see here we had uh, 29 beats here detected, and we had that all the way through, and we stay at about 30 beats up to 10 micromolars, and you plot here your dose response curve. I would like to mention one point before I'm closing. You see in all of our windows, you see this little settings tool. And that allows you to edit your plot, to change a lot of settings, but also to export your data. And export means not just as a graphics file, as a PNG here, but you can also export it, for example, as a DAT file, as an ASCII format. You get it into Excel and you can process your data in Excel very, very easily. And that was the last thing I was going to show you here live in the software. And I think I made use already of three minutes more than I was supposed to. I apologize for that. And I'm more than happy to take questions now. And I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion. Thank you very much so far for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for the presentation. Um, I think you also wanted to show your contact information, so in case anyone has more questions, um, they can always contact you. Very right? welcome, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So, if you have any question, please just use the Q&A window to type it in there. And during the presentation, one question came up. Um, they were asking with which hardware the this, uh, the software can be used? Brief answer, everything except the multi-well system. So it is the in vivo systems, be it the integrated systems, the portable systems with the lower channel count numbers, the higher channel count numbers on the USB systems. It is the whole MEA2100 family. It is the MEA256 family of our systems. And of course, we still support our slightly older systems, so all the MEA60 systems 
are also supported with that. Okay, thank you. Well, I think your presentation was that full of information that no one thinks of questions. Um, so I would just um, close here and uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, we will stay online for another five minutes, so in case some questions come up, um, the Q&A window is still active, and you can still type in there. Um, as promised, we recorded the webinar, and we will send you the link. Um, and please note that we have an upcoming webinar next week on the CMOS system, which Thomas mentioned briefly, our new high-resolution system with over 5,000 electrodes. Um, below you see our phone number and email address, so in case your questions don't come up in the next five minutes, but only later today or tomorrow, please just give us a call or drop us an email. We're always happy to answer any question you might have. Thanks again for attending, and yeah, have a nice day. Thanks again, Thomas, for the presentation. Bye.